Can't you just feel it? The conflict is becoming apparent in our culture. It reminds me of those words of John Paul II. We're now living in the final confrontation between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between the church and the anti-church, between Christ and the antichrist. And if we don't choose to know God's word, to believe God's word, to follow God's word, we're gonna be a sitting duck for all kinds of confusion, all kinds of disorder. Those are really important choices that people have to make. And these choices are difficult. Who am I gonna marry? What kind of life am I gonna live? How am I gonna raise my kids? What am I gonna do with my time, my talent, and my treasure? And I have to make a choice today. Jesus says to each one of us, I came that you might have life and have it to the full. The question is, do we want it? Welcome to another week of Choices We Face. I'm Peter Herbeck. Have you ever wondered who it is, who are the two guys that drive around in the two men in a truck? Well, today I've got one of those two guys, one of the original founders of Two Men in a Truck, and his name is Brig Sorber. Welcome, Brig. Peter, thank you for having me. Yeah, it's great. Uh, I've gotten to know, I've gotten to know you, uh, tell our, our audience, uh, over the last few years, interviewed you on radio, mm -hmm. and I've just been captivated by your story. It's inspiring, it's funny, it's, all, it's just great. But, to begin with, why don't you just say a little bit about yourself and then where Two Men in a Truck, how it all emerged, where it came from. Well, my name is Briggs Sorber, uh, CEO of Two Men in a Truck, one of the original uh, two men. Uh, been married for 31 years to my wife, Francine. I have three kids and expecting my first grandchild uh, in Congratulations. October. Congratulations. So very excited about that, yeah. As far as Two Men in a Truck, uh, it really started out with a 66 Ford uh, pickup truck, an old beater of a truck that was purchased from Michigan State University. It was an old agricultural truck. Uh, for your viewers that had a three on a tree, if you know what that is. Oh yeah, I, had, I used to have a three on a tree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, had a hole in the floor. <laughs> yeah. uh, we did a lot of um, just taking stuff, uh, brush, yard brush uh, to the dump and, and then junk to the dump. And um, my mom also had a business that was running, and what she would do is she would go to auctions, uh, state auctions, and she'd buy things, clean them up, and resell them. So she bought about a 16-foot step van, and she told my brother and I, hey, if you guys want to use this and get into some real moving, feel free. And that was a huge jump for us to leave the truck and go to the step van. Then we started moving um, small uh, uh, homes and apartments and doing delivery of, of used furniture, things like that. The name of the company was Men at Work Movers, and then underneath that, it said two men in a truck, 25 bucks an hour. <laughs> and uh, so it was my mom that meant, that suggested drop Men at Work Movers and call you yourself what you are, and it was uh, two men in a truck. And it was my mom that uh, drew the logo as a joke because we took $3 out of every move that we did, and we put it into an advertising cookie jar, which still sits on my desk to this day. <laughs> And she drew a logo on a napkin with a Sharpie of a cartoon truck and two guys that look like this, <laughs> okay? Yeah. That's still our logo uh, to this day. So your mom was part of the genius behind the whole business. She was. She's the entrepreneur almost, isn't she? She was. I mean, uh, John and I pounded it uh, on those trucks. We had our friends working with us at the time. Uh, my mom loved the business. And when John and I went off to college, the calls kept coming in. So she called and asked, can I keep this thing going and hire a couple guys? And we thought, oh, mom, for sure. And so she did. And when we came back for summer vacation, she bought a new truck. We thought, you're crazy. Now we, <laughs> we actually have a payment. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it worked out well. And we just kept adding uh, trucks, uh, adding guys. And then my sister, Melanie Bergeron, eventually was, got involved too. And she was our first franchisee in Atlanta, Georgia. Oh. Um, Back in like that was a big step, big step, huh? All the way down to Atlanta, yeah, from Lansing, it, Michigan. We learned a lot. I'll tell you, uh, we it wasn't like we knew what we were doing. We learned a lot from the mistakes that we made, and I think stretching out franchises all over the country early, like we did, was not a good idea. It's really what you want to do is keep all those franchises close, use all those marketing dollars together. Okay, uh, but we lived and learned. I'm gonna take a note on that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I've got yeah. a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> you could learn from. Yeah. Now the. Um, uh, the company, the, how big is the company right now? The company now, we have 355 locations in the U.S. Um, in the summer, we run about 10,000 employees. We're probably at about 8,000 right now. We have 29 franchises in Canada. 
we have uh, one in London, England, and one in Dublin, Ireland. And uh, so we're continuously growing. Uh, we are, we've had 93 months of consecutive month-over-month -month growth. Congratulations. So, thank you. We're very oh, proud of that. Impressive. Uh, customer satisfaction, uh, right about 96%. So we have continued that growth, but the important thing is keeping that customer satisfaction right there. Uh, so we've uh, been very pleased with that. Yeah. The customer satisfaction, I think, as I've talked to you before, is related to your perspective on life and your faith in some ways, right? The, the way you run your business is one of the reasons why people are so happy with the business. And your faith in, has informed your business in your whole life. Can you, let's talk a little bit about your faith journey, kind of where you started and how you got here and how that's sure. impacted the business. Well, it's interesting. Um, I was not a Christian. I was not brought up that way. Uh, came from a really good family. We just didn't go to church. I could probably count on one hand the amount of times uh, that, that we went to church. Uh, when our that business, when we started out as kids, um, it did not make a lot of money. We used basically beer and book money for college. Okay? <laughs> um, my mom, when she finally made $1,000 at the end of the year, she took that and broke it up into 10 checks uh, to nonprofits and just gave that away. And so what happened when, when that happened, uh, the Lansing business community saw that, and they loved two men in a truck that, that we would do that and started using the business. So even though I wasn't a Christian, I did see the importance of giving back, uh, putting yourself second. Mm -hmm. um, and that started to, wow, that, that, makes, that makes a big difference. Um, getting to my faith, uh, this business allowed me at a young age, I, my wife and I, uh, we were married. Uh, we got married in, in college. Um, my wife and I got pregnant uh, out of wedlock. She's a Catholic, I was nothing. Um, and it was, those were tough times. We had a lot of people that actually suggested an, an abortion. Um, and my wife said, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. And I fell in love with her more because yeah. she said, you don't have to marry me. Um, I'm having this baby. And I just went, how could I not marry a woman that has so, so much character? We've been married for 31 years now. So she brought me into my faith. Um, a few years after we were married, I, I became, I took the classes, became Catholic but never really leaned on my faith that much. Um, the business continued to grow. Um, it allowed me to have a lot of things. My goal for happiness was really to acquire things. And it was funny, looking back at it, God allowed me to acquire those things. You know what? Let's just give them all he wants and see how that works out for <laughs> you know? So I had the, a nice brick ranch house, a swimming pool, I remember I wanted to join a country club and rub elbows with other rich guys and tell war stories about our businesses. And yeah. I thought wealthy or uh, important uh, men drink scotch and smoke cigars. And so one day I sat by my swimming pool with a scotch and a cigar. And I don't know if your viewers drink scotch or not, but it's horrible. I can't yeah. drink it. Yeah. Like, well, but I did finish my cigar and thought, well, I made it at 32, 33 years old. And I found out Within the next few days, I didn't make anything. I had a real raw feeling in my, in my gut. And really a, a deep depression set in. Mm. And that is really when I found out that what else is there in life? That is when I uh, came to Christ, uh, started reading the Bible. Um, all of a sudden, started praying about those things. God, bring me more resources. I don't, and all of a sudden, my Catholic faith began to flourish. And I looked at my wife and I went, oh my gosh, I took her faith for granted for all these years. And I just caught fire with that. And it, it started to change my life. And then I had this brilliant thought, what if I prayed over the business like I pray over my, my own soul? And the ride that I took, having a moving company during the recession and watching and giving my business to God, and watching what happened with that, that is my testimony. That is where there is a God. Yeah. And it was, it was amazing. We, had, we have no right to even be here right now. I can't tell you how many just-in-time saves people in situations that saved this business by giving it to God. How did you, help us understand, how did you give it to God? What, what looked different? <laughs> what did you do differently? You know? Well, at first, um, I went through different stages. Um, I was a businessman that was not a Christian. 
and I'll explain that really quick. Mm -hmm. I became a businessman that was a Christian, and I eventually became, I'm a Christian who happens to be a businessman, hmm. and there's different steps along the way. And I think, Peter, too, uh, not being a Christian and then becoming a Catholic Christian, um, I don't ever want to go back to, to that. Yeah. God's taken me to a place, and I, I, I want to I go there. But when everything started falling apart, I'll tell you this quick story because it's, it's hilarious. Um, I just started praying on the business, and then uh, the recession hit. Um, what years would that have been? That uh, probably in uh, 06, 07, 08 okay. in, in there. We, we started feeling it a little bit earlier than most. And um, our business was, was, our model was broken and old. And, uh, you know, all of a sudden the, um, uh, the mortgage industry, that whole market collapsed. And when people can't get mortgages, well, they probably don't need a mover. Uh -huh. uh, and if people get kicked out of their houses, well, they probably can't afford a mover. Uh, so we were kind of in that spot. I did know that I had $3 million in a, it was a, a bond security. Um, it's like a money market security fund. I knew I had that. And so I would pray to God, God, what are we going to do with your business? Please tell me what you're going to do. In the back of my mind, it's like, I got $3 million. But God, what are we going to do with the business? So I was kind of hanging on to this. <laughs> yeah. thing. Like he couldn't see that, right? Right, right. And so no, as a kind of, that was your security blanket? It was my blanket? security, okay. but I was still praying. Sure. And uh, all of a sudden the banker called up and said, um, that's not just a money market account. There's actually, uh, um, there's an auction to get that back. That auction collapsed and you now no longer have $3 million. It's all gone. It's gone. Wow. So I walked into my office and as God is my witness, sat down and just started laughing. I went, okay, Lord, now what do you want to do with your business? Because <laughs> I don't have any money. And uh, it, was a, it was a very uh, tough time. Um, we were a, really a mom and pa type corporate office, a lot of operational people that were moved up into those positions, hardworking, really good people. But the job just outgrew a lot of them. Sure. These are the prayers that I had. God, what am I supposed to do with this? And the, the messages just kept coming. And some of these people that I had to, uh, let go had been with the company for 15 plus years because we needed another skill set. So I had $300,000 at my disposal, which is nothing compared to, I know it sounds like a lot, but when you're, you've got this many franchises, right. it's really not. Um, I severanced out a quarter of a million dollars and that was from prayer. Tell me in any business class that they're going to tell you if you have $300,000, you should severance out almost all of it. Which means, explain to some of our listeners may not understand what that means to severance out. When I had to bring in a new skill set and, um, and a lot of the, our hardworking uh, employees, we, they just had to be replaced. And so what I was uh, able to do was, Lansing's a relatively regional sized city, was able to place many of them with other places in the business because yeah. I, I was able to, I, I had some contact and I used myself as a reference. I'm, I mean, not a letter. Here's my cell phone. If you're sitting in an interview, these are my existing employees I let go. You, you have them call me direct. Um, and then what I did was uh, we severance them out dollars. Okay. Uh, so even though they weren't working for, with us anymore, many of them were severanced out three months, six months uh, to give them a landing place, to give them some breather time so they can find another job. Um, by doing that, we were down to... About fifty thousand dollars, which is really—I mean, it was pretty scary time. But when we brought in the new skill sets, this is how God works. Um, they started looking at uh, all of the different uh, deals and contracts that we had, and went, "These contracts are insane. These are bad." And I said, "Yeah, but we're going to abide by them because they're signed." And they said, "Yeah, but we have outs on some of these, or we can renegotiate some of these without breaking any rules or regulations." I said, "Bring them in. Let's see what we can do." We probably saved about a half a million dollars in bad contracts. Um, again, because we did not have the skill set to properly protect ourselves in these. Uh, we also worked with the, uh, um, with, with the state government and, and, and worked with that bank that has our $3 million. And, the, um, and uh, Mike Cox at, at the time worked with him and he sent a letter to the bank and the bank got back our, our $3 million. Wow. So that allowed us to start uh, 
investing that money into really rebuilding the infrastructure of our corporate office. And so I'm giving you like a 10,000 foot view look at this. Thing. Yeah, but if you it get, may sound complicated, you guys listening, but there's a whole lot more to that story. But if story, you get in, yeah. into the weeds, yeah. a lot of it was just uh, prayer and faith. And, uh, and I, I think uh, the viewers too have to understand too that um, I'm a geography major. Uh, I've never taken um, a business class. Um, I do have extremely wildly smart business people, IT people, marketing people working for us. Um, but it was really the faith that brought two men in the truck out of that mm -hmm. recession. And we've been growing, like I said, about 93 consecutive months since the middle of the recession. That's very And there's less moving going on. We're just happy to be doing more of that less moving. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that does. And I think I don't want us to be, I don't want us to miss that transition that happened with you. I really like the way you put it. You know, I was a businessman to happen to be a Christian. Was that the first one? A businessman that wasn't a Christian. That wasn't a Christian. Yeah. Then a businessman that happened to be a Christian. Then you became a Christian who happened to be a businessman. Yes. And, and really, it's the process of discipleship that you went through. You know, like Jesus is the great commission is go make disciples of all nations, right? So what's a disciple? A disciple is a follower of Jesus, someone who's learning how to follow after him, to learn Christ, as Paul would say. And what that means really fundamentally is the process of bringing Jesus into the center of your life. Not on the periphery, right. not just somebody you got to yes. you pay dues to, and you, know, you, you throw bone to him on occasion, yes. but actually he becomes the center and the driver and he gets in the driver's seat is essentially what you ended up doing. You started saying, it's not just your business that you occasionally cry out to heaven for, it's God's business. It is. And he puts you there, right? Yeah, and yeah. You're, you're, you're right on, Peter. And the thing is, is when I became a businessman that claims to be a Christian, I think a lot of us Christian Catholic um, Christian businessmen and women will do that. And I, I can only speak for myself, but let me tell you what that looks like internally is I'm looking at my faith from a distance. I'm looking at Christ from a distance and I'm, I'm, I'm making assumptions on what that means. Uh, socially in this worldly place, I look good because I mentioned Jesus name in a prayer or I have this. When you become a Christian that happens to be a business person, you are working with Christ on yourself. You are asking these questions and you're opening yourself up. And it is a huge difference working, working with Christ one-on-one. -on -one, um, it gives us, um, through Christ, more strength to, to reach out and to disciple in the business. And I truly feel when, when Christ watches us, even though we stumble, I, I really feel he gives us more grace. Yeah. He just goes, you know what? I know he's trying. Yeah. I know he's not the sharpest tool in my shed, yeah. but I like where he's going. And I, <laughs> so you know, I, I, I try to stay with him all the time. Yeah. What a massive difference it is when you're working with Christ one-on-one -on -one as opposed to looking at him from a distance. Yeah. And when I speak, um, I give my, uh, my personal testimony um, mm -hmm. around the country there's a lot of Catholics um, that are in that audience that have been Catholics for a really long time that have to take that one more step right. in that discipleship, that one more step and get closer and, and, and work with Christ. It, it makes a huge difference. Yeah. And we have so many resources that God has given us. Yeah. And I think we have an, an army of disciples that are, that are sitting there on the outside kind of watching this, yeah. looking at like, how does our world look at our, at our faith and our religion? It's like, quit looking at that and get involved in it. Right. You know? Yeah. And our business shows that. Now, people might think, well, you probably have a bunch of Christians working for you. I don't. Uh, we have, a, we have a, um, about 200 uh, uh, employees at our, at our corporate office. We have a Bible study uh, Tuesdays at, at 1130 uh, to 1230. Um, I've got a really good friend of mine who is a, is a, a black Southern Baptist minister that knows this Bible like you would not believe. And uh, God uses him. And we have probably like 15 people that show up at that Bible study. Mm -hmm. But that's okay. I'm yeah. not going to sit here and I don't think God would appreciate me judging people. Mm -hmm. What they have to show in that office is what it looks like to be a Christian businessman. How do I handle myself in, in certain situations? That is how people, I think, that we draw people more to us that way is how do they see us react? Yeah. In, in, in if you're walking business. the walk. Yeah, right. if you're really, if, if, it's, if it's real for you, people can see it. Now, you've, you've got, 
values as a company that are informed partly by your faith in mm -hmm. the sense of, uh, I think coming into the, the building, you have, there's a 10 commandments yeah. on the wall in some place. Just talk about how that has informed uh, and helped created values for your company and why it runs the way it does. Right. Um, and I know when you, you look in the news today, if somebody has the you know, Ten Commandments, they're making a statement. You know, yeah. I've got the Ten Commandments. That's not what this is at all. Uh, we had it um, on, a, on a poster in our office when you, when you walked in. And then when we redid the office, I had an employee come up to me that does not go to our Bible study and said, are you going to put the Ten Commandments back on the wall again uh, inside our foyer? And I went, no. And he's like, why not? I said, because it's going in cement yeah. in the side of our building with all yeah. the light on it. Yeah. He's like, that's awesome. And I said, it is. And it's, and what I told people when we did that, this is not a political statement. This is a, these are uh, the rules of fair play. When you come into this office and you're walking from the parking lot from your car, set your mind straight, look at these rules. You will learn more from the 10 commandments than you will from a two or 300 level college business class. I think, um, and, you know, treating people uh, fairly, being honest, um, all of those things, if you really break them down and, and look at them. Yeah. And it does, it's interesting when we have people that visit us, uh, my window of my office looks down on the parking lot in our front door. It's amazing how many people will take a picture of, of, of the Ten Commandments. It, it shocks mm. them. And I, I do think it sets the standard uh, when, when you walk into our office. Do we fail them sometimes? We're human. Sure. Uh, we, yeah. we, we do, but um, it is good to, to, to look at those things, ask for forgiveness when we do, and try harder. Pick ourselves back up, brush ourselves off, and try yeah. harder the next time. Yeah. You know, there's been a lot uh, written and spoken about over the last 50 years in the church, starting with the Second Vatican Council and then the, 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 uh, the papacies of John Paul II, Pope Benedict XVI, about the emergence of the laity and the apostolate of the laity. And it's all, and one of the fundamental building blocks of it is the, uh, the commitment to the temporal order, that lay people live in the world, mm -hmm. you know, and that we're meant to be a light in the world. We're meant to, to inform what we're doing with the faith, not push the faith on people, but to really walk the walk, as you're saying. Yes. And, and I think that's one of the reasons why I've loved interviewing you over these years, because you're, you're an example of that. So if I say those things, you know, I'll talk to guys in different parts of the world and say, well, okay, well, you, you do that for a living, you know what I mean? And, and, but to hear it from somebody who's come from your background and runs a business that everybody knows, because sometimes people separate sort of the rough and tumble approach to business from their, maybe their faith life, and they separate the two things, mm -hmm. you know, and they don't want one to inform the other, and they don't always behave very much like a Christian in that context. And I think... A, you know, your story, again, hearing it today, parts of it today is that, is that idea that I, the most fundamental thing in my life is my relationship with God, mm -hmm. is my relationship with Christ. And that's what informs my whole outlook on life. And that's why I value human beings, because he values them so right. much and loves them so right. much, right? Right. Yeah. You know, I'm going through a transition, too. I, I was not a Christian. Uh, I became a Christian. Um, I became that I'm a businessman who happens to be a Christian where I, where I find a lot of my friends. Um, and now I'm a Christian who happens to be a businessman. I also struggle because I have to let go of my past. I have to let go of some of the, um, the friends that I have. It's, 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 it's odd. And some of them are, are letting go of me. Like, yeah. that guy's odd. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I'm in a transition. Um, I'm not perfect. And thank right. God I've, I've got Jesus that I, that I can ask for forgiveness. Right. Because I do have an odd sense of humor. I do say things that are off color. I do say things that make Christians go like, you're Christian? It's like, yeah. I blew that one, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I'm, it, it is a, uh, and we have to understand that we're all, we're all broken. Yeah. And I do think that we have some Christian people that think they've got to be so squeaky clean. They have to prove to themselves. It's like, no, no, don't, don't do that. Um, the only thing that is going to clean you is the blood of Christ. Mm -hmm. It's not you being a, doing a better job at, yeah. at having people perceive that, that you're clean. That's a, really, that's a really good point, I think, because for guys in particular, you feel like, well, look, I, who am I to do anything spiritual because I'm not perfect, because I'm, otherwise they feel like a hypocrite or I'm not far enough along, something like that. Instead of just ex, you know, receiving Christ into your heart, go to confession, yeah. let the Lord just 
let the Lord just take it away. There's pastors in the Bible said he wants to throw your sins behind your back. He's not staring at those. He's staring at you, mm -hmm. and he sees in you the potential of everything the Father made you to be, and Jesus is in your corner, and he wants to help you get to where the Father has destined you to be. He's your greatest advocate. Absolutely. He's your best friend. He's your Lord. He's, he's everything for you, and he wants to help you get to a place. And I think, um, what would you say to guy, uh, guys might be watching and say, you know, uh, you know, he's, what you're saying is touching their heart, but it's, it's a little scary letting go. Like, what would you say to them? I would say that um, Jesus is, is not sitting browbeating you. That, that's how I felt. Yeah. And I started reading in, in the Bible, and I, I'm just not there yet where I can, like, quote exactly out of the Bible. Yeah. There's a couple things that really made me feel good. Maybe you know where they are. Uh, one is that the Holy Spirit is given to us, and the Holy Spirit prays for us. And he prays in groanings that we can't understand to God. He prays for us. That is amazing to me. Yeah. Is that, wait, I got to prove myself to God. No, you can't. Because here's number one, you can't do anything that makes you right with God. You can't. So if you want to walk the old lady across the street or, yeah. or give your money, this, that's still not good enough to clean you up for God. That gave me great relief. It's like, okay, so I can't try hard enough. It's like, no, you can't. And number two, you don't even know what to pray for. So God gives you the Holy Spirit to pray for you because you're so broken you can't pray for yourself. Those two things right there break down all of that stuff. That's great. That's what brings Christ close to us and works with us. Great, very good. Thank you so much for being with us. Yeah. Thank you so much for the life Thank that you, you're Pete. leading. And friends, um, I hope you're able to take this message to heart, especially any men or business leaders who are watching the program because the Lord wants you to know right there in the heart of it, he's with you. I also want to tell you about a booklet we'd like to give to you free for the asking call, What Happens When I Die. It'll be, uh, you can get it at our website at renewalministries.net. There's an 800 number that'll appear on the screen. And then after the program, there's going to be a brief video. I encourage you to stay tuned and watch. But till next week, this is Briggs Sorber, Peter Herbeck saying, God bless you. Let's trust in the Lord. We all die, but not all deaths are the same. To die in unrepented sin is a bitter death that will only lead to the indescribable agony of eternal separation from God. But to die as a Christian, our sins forgiven, is to die a very different kind of death, a death which has now been transformed into a doorway to paradise. I've written a booklet called What Happens When I Die to help you and I end up in paradise rather than in hell. Go to our website, renewalministries.net, and simply click on the booklet or call the number on the screen and we'll send it right out to you just for the asking for free. What a gift we've been given. We can die in the love of Christ and be with Him forever.